Morata, Morata, in destro, bene per Di Bala, sinistro, gol! Lewandowski, ball rein mit den Imitze, Schieber mit dem Kopf, Reus, Quer, Linie, Tor, 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 Tor! Hello and welcome to the Football Hipsters podcast episode 27. I am your host Chris and as usual I'm joined by my merry bunch of footballing men. Good evening to John, Tom and Drew. Hello chaps. Good evening. Evening. Hey guys. We're all back again talking football just for a change. And um, we've got not only have we got midweek action, we've got weekend action as well. We've got loads to cover. So we'll, uh, we'll, we won't waste any time. We'll get straight into it and we'll start where we always do. It's this week's Mighty 90. Right. So let's see what has been happening with our clubs. And Tom, we're going to start with you for a little mm. Austrian action. So I shall get the old stopwatch ready. And your update on Red Bull Salzburg begins now. OK, so I guess I should start with what happened in midweek. Uh, we played our cup game, our semi-final cup game against Austria Vienna. Big game. Uh, and we won 5-2. Um, Soriano obviously scored. Uh, Olmer, uh, Larson got an own goal for Austria Vienna and Lima, the young Austrian centre midfielder, came on and scored two late on. Uh, so that's a great win and we're going to the final, uh, which is a, which will be great for the team. So uh, anyway, back to league action. Uh, we went away to Alltac. Minamino, Minamino got a start in a front three of himself, Lazaro and Soriano. Schwegler returned at right back and uh, we got an early lead in the third minute. Uh, Schwegler new into the side this week. Uh, good combination down the right-hand side with Soriano. Laid through to Cater and Cater finished high into the left-hand side of the net. And then nine 19 minutes in, we made it 2-0. A Lazaro corner flicked on by Miranda, found Coletta Carr, the Croatian centre-back at the back, who headed in uh, to make it 2-0. Uh, and then Altak did get one back in 22 minutes. Some poor defending allowed Prokovic to shot to flecked off striker Aigner to make it 2-1. And then after many chances, including some excellent saves from Valka, uh, we managed to get an, uh, another stoppage time goal to make it finish 3-1. Soriano laid through Lyman, the man who scored two goals in midweek. And uh, his shot... Uh, just went in. There was a slight block, but it still managed to roll in. Um, so that was it. That was full time. 1-3-1. One, one. Uh, Rapid Vienna beat Sturm Graz 2-0. So with four games to go, we're still six points ahead in the league with a superior goal difference. So you've got to hope that we can get through our next couple of games and come out in the league as champions. Lovely job. Lovely job. Some interesting names there as well. like it. Right. OK, so that's one out the way. John, I'll move across to you now and see what's been happening in uh, in Germany. Gladbach were at home, so surely they must have won. Your Mighty 90 begins now. Yeah, uh, Gladbach were hosting uh, Hoffenheim, who are down near the bottom, uh, not far off relegation. So both teams really needed the points. But as Chris said, Gladbach were at home, so of course we won. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, three one wins Gladbach. Um, opening goal from Andre Hahn. Well, I say Andre Hahn. It wasn't really, but um, we'll pretend it was him. A really nice ball from Granit Xhaka. Uh, lovely through ball to Oscar Fenn coming down the left wing. Really uh, beautifully pulled back, squared for Andre Hahn, but um, actually ended up as an own goal for Tolian, uh, the Hoffenheim defender. Um, we played really well. Hoffenheim are actually quite decent, but um, we were pressing them quite hard at the pitch, uh, as we tend to do at home, and um, we managed to. Uh, get a lucky break of the ball, fell to Xhaka again he did a wonderful little outside of the boot ball, uh, straight into Raphael in the box, he got his shot off uh, keeper made a save but uh, the ball was a little scramble there with Andre Hahn who um, kicked the ball out of the keeper's hand so maybe got a bit lucky there that there wasn't a free kick given away uh, but the ball fell to Dahoud who calmly slotted away with uh, two defenders on the line so 2-0 um, we did concede one put ourselves under a little bit of pressure Nico Alverdi uh, gave the ball away uh, with uh, Kramerich getting the goal for Hoffenheim who Leicester fans will remember um, but the last goal was actually for Hahn so he did officially get on the score sheet uh, De Hood winning the ball back in midfield and uh, f- uh, beating the offside trap um, he was excellent in the game throughout so De Hood definitely man of the match um, so we're still fifth in the table Lovely job. Thank you very much, John. So uh, here is a pattern developing here. Home win, away, 
no win. Let's move on to the next one then. And uh, Drew Feinord, who I believe had a home tie with Utrecht, I think it was this week, from memory. So your Mighty 90 on that game begins now. Well, uh, we actually had two. Midweek, we uh, paid a visit to Heracles on Melo, uh, and then we ended up drawing 2-2. Uh, it's difficult for me to say if it was a poor result. I mean, Heracles, are, they're decent at home. They've only lost three times uh, in, in 16 home outings, and you know they're neck deep in that Europa League playoff places. So uh, I guess a 2-2 draw would be fair. It's never going to be easy going there. Uh, you know, uh, we, we were down early on 12 minutes. Robin Goosen got the opener. Michel Kramer responded on 39 minutes to, to level matters. Uh, Vote Veghorst uh, restored Heracles' lead on, on 49 minutes. And then um, Elhar Elia uh, leveled matters on 73 minutes and uh, ended 2-2. Um, and it was, uh, I hate to say it again, but it was more of like a, a typical Arsenal performance where we dominated the match uh, in regards to you know possession. We, we created four times the amount of chances. Uh, but Heracles were a little more lethal with, with their opportunities. You know, they only had six sides on target, but found that twice. Uh, um, disappointed from Kenneth Vermeer um, in that. But um, Elliot was our best player. Michel Kramer turned up. Uh, Dirk Hout actually had to come off the bench, and uh, he didn't do very, very well either. Um, so it's disappointing, but, you know, we're still four points clear with two matches to go. And with the schedule we have left, I think we're going to be okay. Uh, but, um, and in regards to our match against Utrecht, that was uh, actually the Dutch Cup final. We won 2-1. So, a uh, good way to close out the week. Um, and again, I just feel like, you know, destiny is in our hands. We win next weekend. Um, that's the season we have uh, third place solidified, so we'll see. Good stuff. There was um, quite a nasty-looking injury in that game. So was it to Dirk Kout? I think it was. I don't know. Somebody went off on a stretcher. I remember watching it. It looked like quite a nasty injury. So, I'll have to look up who that was later. Anyway, uh, just me to go then, so I shall put the clock on myself, and my time begins now. So, uh, this week, uh, Lorient played the uh, the Cup de France semi-final against PSG, lost 1-0. Moving on, we can... <laughs> yes, it was that bad. Uh, actually, they were quite unlucky. They had a few chances, but uh, couldn't put the ball in the net, so PSG progressed. Never mind. On to the weekend. Didn't get much better, unfortunately. Away at the Steph- Stade Geoffrey Guichon Stadium in St. Etienne, 29,550. Watched a St. Etienne victory, unfortunately. Uh, Belagou and Paye came in at the back, and Abdullah and Barton Almey came into the midfield. Uh, first chance of the game really fell to the home side. Lecomte saving well from uh, Kevin Monipake, who's a former Lorient player himself. And uh, largely forgettable first half. The only other incident really was Tanane's long-range shot, which was also quite comfortably saved. Uh, second half, though, Lorient missed a great chance to go in front from McAndrew. Shot over from uh, about 10 yards and 47 minutes. And wouldn't you know it, 10 minutes later, uh, Saul headed uh, a corner just uh, just wide from uh, Hamuma's cross. And then St. Etienne took the lead through Nolan Roux's finish. Uh, it was coming, to be fair. And then seconds remaining, they made the points safe with a second. Uh, Rafa Guerrero had a bit of a nightmare, got tied in knots, and uh, Roux latched onto a long punt downfield from the goal past Lecomte for the second goal. Um, not a great result, not a great week for Lauren, unfortunately, but they now sit 13th in Liga. Still 43 points for the drop zone. Should be fun. This weekend's home game is against Lille, who sit currently 6th. That will be a tricky one. So there we go. Two defeats in a week for Lorient. Not good. Never mind. We roll on. We roll on. Speaking of rolling on, we shall roll on in the podcast. And we'll start, as we always do, with our weekly look at the stats from around Europe. It's the world of football. Okay, then, let's take a look. Busy week in Europe, of course, with lots of midweek action. So uh, these stats might look uh, a little bit out of place because uh, they're a bit higher numbers than usual. But we'll run through them. So the Premier League, we had uh, eight matches played, of course, across the course of the week. 25 goals, four clean sheets, one red card, two home wins and two away wins. In France, in Ligue 1, 25 goals from the eight matches played, uh, two clean sheets, uh, four red cards, four home wins and one away in La Liga, we had 20 games, so basically two rounds of games, 64 goals, 10 clean sheets, three red cards, 10 home wins, four away. In Serie A in Italy, also two, two rounds of matches played, 20 games, 53 goals, 11 clean sheets, nine red cards, 14 home wins, three away. And finally in the Bundesliga, just the one weekend of uh, a Bundesliga action, 31 goals, 
from the nine games three clean sheets one red card four home wins and four away from home so the stats from the weekend well there was or safe in the weekend from the week i should say it was a week of 198 goals woof 30 clean sheets 18 red cards 34 home wins 14 away and that was from 65 games played in total across our leagues so uh, plenty of uh, plenty of action going on across the uh, the leagues this week and a couple of stats to pull up uh let's see let's have a look at clean sheets currently uh out in front it's it's a draw at the moment actually la liga and uh liga 146 apiece um but Serie A just behind 144 premier league just behind them on 142 the bundesliga 109 clean sheets this season here's an interesting stat nil nil draws this season 31 and the highest is in the premier league uh, it's been 29 in liga 27 in Serie A, 24 in la liga and 20 in the bundesliga and the final one i'll pick out Good old red cards. We always like red cards, don't we? 114. Where do you think? Italy. Serie A, 114 out in front. 113 in Liga, just behind. 97 in Spain in La Liga. 53 in the Premier League and 37 in the Bundesliga. So uh, there's a couple of stats for you. Just uh, sort of nipping around the leagues. And uh, thank you to Kelly for compiling compiling those stats as usual. Appreciated. Right then. So that's the numbers game out the way let's move into our roundups and we're going to start with john this week and it's this week's Serie A. Right, hello, John. Now uh, it's been it's been quite a quite a busy week of, of yeah, Serie A action. So. Um, we, we can start with. Uh, I know you don't want to sort of cover no. these in too much detail, but do you want to start with the midweek games from last week? Yeah, I'll happened? just give some uh, highlights. Uh, Napoli thumped Bologna six nil. Uh, quite impressive. No Higuain in that game either. He was still serving his suspension. Uh, Sassuolo against Sampdoria and Milan versus Carpi were both nil nil. So a good result there for Carpi. Uh, Empoli got a one nil win over Verona, and Genoa did the same against Inter. Ugh. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> for the rest of the games. Um, so there was uh, the Roma game was in particular was exciting, but Roma, Juventus, Chievo, and Udinese all recorded wins. Uh, whilst Palermo and Atalanta played out a two-all draw. Um, we would go into more detail, but um, obviously we've got this weekend's fixtures and uh, a certain title to talk about as well. So we sadly haven't got time. No, and we will save the title talk yeah. for in a moment because uh, that has come about because of the results of the weekend. But um, let's start with uh, our club, shall we say, uh, Inter, who they had a, they were a bit kind of um, sidetracked with that defeat. It, yes, you said it was Genoa yeah. in midweek, wasn't it? The one 0 defeat. So they very much had to win at home to Udinese. Didn't start very well, but ended yeah, a lot better. Finished three uh, one to Inter in the end. Um, it's actually made history in Syria. It was the first game where neither team had an Italian in the starting eleven, um, which I didn't realise had never happened before. But um, yeah, apparently first game, first time it's ever happened. Um, but yeah, as you said, didn't start great. Uh, Udinese uh, really started the game very well, uh, putting lots of pressure on Inter, and um, scored a spectacular goal. Uh, Badu did a great little chip ball. Uh, up uh, over the inter defence and um, Cyril Ferru, um, 33 year old Cyril Ferru, by the way, um, took it first time over the shoulder volley. Um, everyone knows what they look like, absolute stunner, well worth looking up. Um, really, really good goal, and it really stunned Inter. Um, at 33 years old, gives me hope yet that I can perhaps still do things on a football pitch. But um, anyway, um, in a tr- you know they struggled a little bit to come back into the game, and it wasn't till uh, sort of halfway through the first half they started knocking on the door a bit. Uh, Condogbia in particular actually starting to impress a bit more in midfield, and Brozovic as well uh, was very very good in the game. Um, but it was uh, Icardi who was fighting for the ball, keeping it alive in the box, and managed to square it for a nice easy tap in for Jovetic, who uh, wandered in unmarked, uh, got the comeback on. Um, and then the second, um, uh, another one, uh, Brozovic again, really, really well uh, in this game, really played well, picking passes out, um, put a perfectly timed ball for Biabiani running down the right flank, who I really didn't realise just how quick he is, uh, but amazing speed, uh, and he pulled the ball back for Jovetic and into second, um, and there was a third goal very late on, about the 95th minute I think it was, um, Brozovic again with the through ball. Um, and it was Eder with his first goal for the club. Um, so Inter 
because of the defeat to Genoa, were kind of resigned to the fact that they probably are going to miss out on Champions League. Um, but this result gave them a tiny slimmer of home. It's still very, very unlikely. But um, good news that Ed has got his first goal, and they can at least look like um, they're going to secure fourth, probably. I really like Sir Altero. Uh, I, I always liked him. I know he's old and he's a bit lumbery, but he's just one of those cool little throwback strikers. Yes. And uh, and a good win for Inter. So um, happy happy days, happy days for fans. Um, let's move on to uh, to Frosinone Palermo. Now, this was uh, obviously a game that had massive repercussions mm-hmm. at the bottom of the table, with uh, Fros in nineteenth, Palermo at the time at eighteenth. And it was, of all teams, the away team that picked up the points. Uh, surprising? Uh, yeah, very. Um, the, the game itself was pretty poor, to be honest. Um, lots of uh, serious lack of quality on, on show from both teams, uh, which is not particularly surprising considering their positions in the table. Um, but two goals, uh, basically from, I mean, the, the, the first goal for Palermo was uh, Giladino. Um, and just a simple cross into the box and a typical Giladino header um, just wasn't defended very well by Frosinone which has obviously been one of their big problems this season um, and the second was a late goal on the counter uh, with just uh, late on into the game uh, Tragovsky um, getting the goal for Palermo but it, it's an amazing turnaround considering the, again the change of manager um, you know the, the way the club just looked to be just totally tanking um, and Frosinone after they'd been on a bit of a high um you know, maybe looking like they might be able to jump Palermo and then just trying to catch up with Carpi. Uh, it's a real massive blow for them. Um, and Palermo have definitely got the easier of the run-ins uh, of games to go because uh, Fraz and Carpi have, have got big games against uh, the likes of Napoli and Juventus, which you perhaps wouldn't really fancy them in. And Palermo have got sort of the, the more mid-table to lower-table teams to play. Um, where you expect they might be able to get a result against teams who basically don't really have anything to play for. Um, so it gives them a little bit of a chance to pay, perhaps get themselves out of it, but, but uh, really, really bad for Frosinone. Yeah, well, um, we'll touch on that that bottom three in a minute, but it, it's all getting very to- very close down there, very tight. But um, something that isn't particularly tight or close going into the weekend was the title race. Now, Juventus arrived in Florence uh, to play Fiorentina, knowing that if they were to win and uh, Napoli were to fail to win, which we'll come on to in a minute, they would be champions. They did their bit on Saturday uh, night. Yeah, they did. Um, to be fair, Fiorentina made it very difficult. Sunday Fiorentina night, sorry. made it very, very difficult for them. Um, and perhaps might feel a little bit hard done by it that I didn't at least get a point out of the game. Um, Juve, Juve won 2-1. Um, Kadira had a... Uh, there was two disallowed goals very early on. Kadira's first uh, for Juventus, which was correctly disallowed uh, for offside. But then Fiorentina scored, and Bernadeschi was incorrectly called as offside. He's actually level with Barzoli. So Fiorentina should have taken the lead. Um, and they could have, were it not for Buffon as well, other than the linesman getting the decision wrong, Buffon has made some really, really good saves in this game um, from Bernadeschi, Kalenic, um, Ilicic. Uh, oh, no, sorry, he didn't make a save from Ilicic as he injured himself taking a shot, which was slightly hilarious. But I know you shouldn't laugh at a player getting injured, but that's always funny when you see things like that. But um, it, w- it was Juve who took the lead in the end, um, and it was a bit of a role reversal. It was uh, Paul Pogba knocking the ball down from Mandzukic rather than the other way around um, for the big Croat to volley in from 12 yards. Um, and then it was basically a very, very tight game, end-to-end, um, both teams creating chances, neither could take them. Um, something historic also happened in this game. Daniele Rogani got his first ever booking in Syria after 33, uh, sorry, 53 appearances, um, which is quite some feat, so he got his first yellow card. But um, Fiorentina's hard work did pay off. They managed to get a goal back. Bonucci um, rarely, rarely makes mistakes, but he was caught in possession, dawdling a bit, and Kalinic scored a really good goal from the edge of the box. Um, but Juve... Uh, took the lead almost instantly straight from kickoff. went down the other end won a corner Mandzukic knocked down scrambled in the box and Morata was just the quickest to react um, and it was 2-1 I, I really thought that that was it game done you know Fiorentina would give it up but then right at the end uh, Fiorentina won a penalty uh, very soft one it must be said for a foul by uh, Quadrado on Kalinic but um, Big Gigi stepped up yet again uh, saved the shot from Kalinic and then saved the follow up shot from Bernadeschi as well um, and then even after that, Fiorentina then got a corner and Kalinic also hit the underside of the bar with a header. Um, so Juve were really made to sweat for it, but they got the three points and basically all eyes then turned to Rome to see what happened in that game. 
That uh, Gigi Buffon, he, he might be quite good. He, he looks yeah, like a promising yeah. player. Yeah, big big future ahead of him, that young lad. Um, I have to say as well that is, I think it was the second Juve goal yeah. was delicious. I think it was, I think it's the second one. Really, really beautiful bit of football. So uh, yes, yeah, so that was uh, that was Juventus then um, sort of doing their bit as it were to win the the championship, which put all the pressure on Napoli, who had a tough looking game today. Uh, today being Monday, uh, away at Roma. And it was a very, very late sting in the tail, which might have repercussions. Uh, uh, yes, Go it on. was. Uh, it was a Roma win, which meant that Juve did indeed win the title today. Um, as for the Roma Napoli game itself, um, it was obviously huge for Napoli coming into it, and uh, probably the biggest plus was that Higuain was back from suspension. Um, they knew that nothing more than three points could keep them in the chance of perhaps still getting the title off of Juve um, they also had the fact that this is against Roma who are obviously the closest team below them chasing them down trying to get that second uh, automatic spot for the Champions League so big game from both angles um, and Roma had a few chances but it was Napoli really who pressured all game and it was um, it was a really good rear guard performance from Roma which is something we haven't seen a lot this season uh, Chesney was, uh, made some really really good saves this game definitely made a match uh, Rudiger as well made some great tackles uh, in particular a really good last ditch one on uh, Marek Hamsik who looked dead set to just score like a five yard tap in uh, Rudiger came out of nowhere to make a fantastic tackle um, and then sort of 80 odd minutes in uh, sorry before that Totti came on uh, late as he had done in the last couple of games, um, the crowd were up even more as soon as Totti comes on. Um, you know, the, the the Olympic Stadium really, really does make some noise, and um, they passed it around Napoli's box for a couple of minutes, and uh, just found a bit of space, and finally picked out Nyingolan, who did what he does best when he shoots from the edge of the box, and just put it in the bottom corner. Um, so yeah, one one nil to Roma, a massive result for them, really, really good. Uh, closes that gap on Napoli, uh, disaster for Napoli. Um, and yeah, Juve, Juve win the Scudetto for the fifth time. So um, congratulations, Juventus. Um, I think everyone will agree that they definitely deserve a champions. Um, but a little bit of a disappointing end to the end of the, uh, the season because I really thought Napoli could push him all the way. But uh, you know, the, the suspension to Higuain and a couple of Napoli's sort of drop points where they shouldn't have has just let them down at the last hurdle. Absolutely. And two things on that, of course, we should say, I mean, Juventus, when you think of the start they had, this is quite, quite the achievement. I mean, I know everyone will say, oh, Juventus won the league boring, yawn, yawn, yawn. But the start they had, they gave everyone a real opportunity to take over and they still ended up winning. And of course, also, we should say that Napoli, yes, they'll probably look at it and think, mm, we, we could have won this, but it's still a hell of an achievement for them to finish second. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if they, if they can get second, it, it's good, but they will still rue the the wasted opportunity they had at the Scudetto this year. I'll, I'll, I'll get on to the sort of points difference and where it was for Juventus uh, earlier on in the season in a little bit. I'll just um, give you the other results from the other games in the league. Please, yeah, uh, please so do. Atalanta got a 1-0 win over Kievo. Bologna won 2-0 over Genoa. Uh, Carpi got themselves another win, 1-0 at home to Empoli. Very good for them. Uh, Samp beat Lazio 2-1. Torino lost 3-1 at home to Sassuolo. Verona beat Milan 2-1 unbelievable result um, but sadly it doesn't save them um, as we will explain in a minute because I'll give you the table uh, Juventus are top 85 points they are champions now 35 games played 27 wins 4 draws 4 losses um, goal difference plus 49 um, fantastic still another 3 games to go so they really can do it Napoli at the moment obviously in 2nd on 73 and then Roma are just 2 points behind them now with 3 games to go so really is tightening up there Inter mathematically can still get 3rd but it's very unlikely they are uh, 7 points behind Roma so don't expect to see that happening uh, down at the bottom Verona are officially relegated uh, we all knew it was coming but mathematically now they are gone they're on 25 points um, they've had some good results of lately I mean that, that result against Milan is fantastic but just not good enough Frosinone on 30 Palermo on 32 and Carpi now up to 35 points only 3 behind Udinese so they could even jump them as well so um, Carpi really giving themselves a fighting chance yeah, I, you, as I, I think we said last week, weren't we, Udinese are, are not safe just yet. And um, 
yeah, with their away record, I, I do wonder. But I hope Carpy stay up just because, well, it's Carpy. Um, now, you haven't got any news, but you wanted to give us just a couple of stats before we finish off about Juventus and just how good they've been to come back yeah, from that it's, start. Um, it's their fifth good in a row, which has um, only been achieved by three other teams, um, which the, the three previous teams was Juventus themselves back in the 1930s. Uh, Il Grande Torino, which is... Uh, was the altar inside in the 1940s which is sort of now what Torino is um, and Inter Milan between 2006 and 2010 uh, it must be said however though that the 2006-2007 championship was only awarded to them later and that was um, because of the uh, Calciopoli scandal um, so it's not really five years in a row that they won the Scudetto but they it says they did so you know I, I'm not sure you can really count in for that Um yeah, just a, just a few quotes from the players. One in particular I really liked was uh, Buffon, classy as ever, um, came out and uh, dedicated the league win to Claudio Marquisio, who obviously went off with that ACL injury, so missed the Euros. Uh, also claimed he'd uh, play for another two years at the top level, which um, I don't think anyone's going to dispute because he's been in great form this season. Um, just to show how far they come back, in November they were 12th, 11 points off the top, and now they're three games to go, um, 12 points clear. Uh, and in their last 25 games, they've had one draw and 24 wins in the league. Um, just amazing form. Um, I know lots of people say it about La Liga, they play it, say about Serie A, and uh, they say it about the Bundesliga. It's a, you know, only one or two teams ever win it. Um, and in t- Excuse me? <laughs> and, in, and in Italy in particular, they always say, oh, it's just Juventus. Um, but you've still got to go out and do it. And I, I'm, I'm by no means a Juventus firm. I'm in the through and through, and I hate Juventus, but you cannot do anything but applaud that team and Allegri and what he's done there it's uh, it's incredible yeah absolutely his stock is rising big time and um, and what's even more impressive of course they lost so many players and replaced them and they yep. still won it it's, it's incredible really but yeah hats off to them and uh, indeed a uh, big shout to one of our previous guests Mina uh, your team has done it so very good. OK, let's move on then and uh, we'll switch gears to a, another league. Uh, actually, no, before we do, you have to give us a game, oh, John. Yes. I forgot all about that. Yeah, is there um, one to look up for this week? See? Um, Juventus are playing Carpi. Um, it's a home for Juve. Obviously won the title, Ooh. but they'll be at the J Stadium. The fans will all be celebrating. They were celebrating with the players today at the, uh, at the training camp um, with the champagne and everything, which is nice to see some great scenes. If you go on Juventus Twitter, you'll, you'll see some of the videos. Um, but obviously Carpi want to keep up that run of trying to stay up. Um, Juve won't want to discipline their fans at home despite the sort of party atmosphere. Um, so it'll be, it should be a really interesting game and it'll be a great atmosphere as well. I've got to say, I love the video of Pogba just like, oh, yeah. falling to the floor. There's, there's it was, it was hilarious. I'm sure that the <laughs> players will be absolutely ripping him for that as well. Because, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's some really good scenes. There's a great one of Allegri coming in and uh, yeah, just getting absolutely soaked in champagne. You gotta love it. You gotta love it. A title win. What's that? Can't remember. Anyway, let's uh, let's switch gears then and uh, and see what is happening this week across another area. It's in Germany and it's this week's Bundesliga. Okay then, Drew. So, Bundesliga, what's been happening this week? We should touch on the DFP Pokal midweek fixtures. There's two semi-finals. How did they go, first of all? Uh, well, they went as expected. Uh, Bayern were uh, comfortable to nothing winners at home uh, against Werder Bremen, and uh, Hertha got smashed uh, in the capital 3 nothing by Borussia Dortmund. So, um, that's... Hurt to now only have uh, one thing to look forward to, which is trying to get that Champions League spot. So we'll see how they respond um, after the weekend that just passed. So, yeah. So that's them through. So uh, it's a Dortmund Bayern final? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, that's going to be on May 21st, so just about a month from now. <clears throat> Interesting. And that's isn't that a repeat of last year as well, isn't it? It is indeed. Right. Good stuff. Okay, fun, fun times. All right then, uh, let's move on to our usual rundown of the the weekend's action then. And uh, this uh, this this game we're going to pick up first of all Wolfsburg, um, <laughs> who hmm, yes Wolfsburg. Oh. Um, th- this was one that I mean I called it weirdly, but 
despite Augsburg coming to town being quite low down and struggling for points, you just had a feeling, didn't you? And the feeling was right. Well, I mean, you, you had to. The, the, the thing is, you know, Augsburg aren't in the greatest form at the moment. You know, they've lost two of the last six. Uh, one of those were draws. One, three out of their last six matches. But Wolfsburg, on form, are, are tied for the worst form uh, in the Bundesliga right now with uh, Stuttgart, actually. So, um, and even though historically they're they're so good uh, in front of their home supporters, this, I'm not really all that shocked either, you know. Um, Augsburg won on the road. It was a really good performance. And uh, a first win uh, goal from uh, Alfred Finbogassen sort of really set the tone. Uh you know, and it's unfortunate for them because uh, Max Kruse actually could have uh, leveled matters um, uh, about, was it, 34, 35 minutes through the first half. We actually hit the bar from six yards out. Um, and uncharacteristic from him, you know, usually he'll, he'll tuck those away. You know, I'm not his biggest fan. You know, he has his up and downs, but uh, a player of at least his ability should, should have rammed that home. And that could have changed, you know, the landscape just a little bit. Uh, but it wasn't to be. Uh, and then uh, um, Hello Alton Top uh, made it 2 0 in 57 minutes, and you know that was that kind of put the match to bed. Um, this is a, um, it was a typical performance from Augsburg that we saw from them last season a lot. You know when they made that run to fifth, um, and they've been struggling a little more this season, obviously. But um, from from back to front, you know everybody was solid. You know there wasn't one poor performance in the pitch, um, and it's coming at a time where um, mathematically they still can um, get relegated, but um, I think they're going to be okay. Um, I also wanted to highlight um, the contributions from Kayubi uh, on the left, actually. Um, didn't get a goal, didn't get an assist, um, but his contributions on both sides of the ball were fantastic. You know, when he got forward, he tried to beat players for pace on the ball, but he actually helped um, tracking back uh, with Philip Max playing at left back. You know, um, Kayubi actually, if I remember, he won eight headers, he put in six tackles, he was all over the place. And I think that that was a key performance that really um, sort of rammed home the style that suits Augsburg most is that everybody contributes everywhere. And if they can keep doing that for the remaining matches of the season, I think they're going to be okay. Absolutely. And, and Hertha Berlin will move on to next, speaking of sides that are somewhat falling off a little bit. Now, they entertained the champions elect by Munich and it came, came unglued again at home. Maybe their Champions League sort of dreams are falling a little bit. Um, I don't. I mean, it's 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 going to be tough to say. They're still in the driver's seat because they're still sitting in fourth. Um, but they're winless in their last four. Um, and uh, as Gladbach won at the weekend, you know, Gladbach are only a point away. Um, Mainz uh, have hit a bit of a uh, patchy form, but they're still only four points behind as well. So, um, they're going to look behind. It's, it's I don't think they even catch the Leverkusen. Um, they're going to look behind them and try and see that you know, it's it's now it's about results, one match at a time have to win next weekend and then build from that, you know, and the remaining matches after that. But um, it's just one of those matches where Bayern had to only show up and play at 50% um, and, and still get the result. You know, just, you know, Robert Lewandowski and, and Thomas Miller in particular, neither of them played particularly well. Um, Mario Götze got a start, you know, just behind Lewandowski and he did okay. He, he bagged an assist. Um, Tua Vidal was actually probably their, their best performer on the day. You know, Douglas Costa did his thing and still got a goal, but uh, Hertha just didn't show up think of a single player from their 11 or even players that um, Pal Dardai brought off the bench that really performed, you know, um, Solomon Kalu didn't even start. Um, he came off the bench and it was ineffective. You know, Julian Schieber came off the bench as well and he was also ineffective. So it's, I think it's, it's been a little bit, you know, um, uh, apart from this season, you know, every act that they're there and they should be, you know, they don't have, when you look at it, when you look at their 11 or, or even their first team squad in general, they don't really have enough quality really to be where they're at and it, it might be catching up with them a little bit now you know they when you look at someone else like you know look at the Leicester, like they have a few key players and hard to have a few key players but I, I think past those few key players there's not enough there you know they do have they do play, play really well defensively they keep their shape really well they do work hard and whatnot but if you look at their their things in the bundesliga from last season and, and moving back you know they finished you know 18th in, in, in 09010 and got relegated they count the next season you know and, and but 11 12 they got relegated you know, in 13 after coming back again, you know, they finished 11th. You know, I think last season they finished, you know, just above the relegation spot. So, and now all of a sudden, you know, they're fighting for a Champions League place. So you kind of have to wonder if, A, the quality that they have is going to see them through, and B, they've never been in this scenario since, oh, I don't even know how long when. Let me see. Since uh, 08 or 09 when they finished fourth. But then before then, the two seasons passed, they finished 10th before that. So, Paul Dode, he has his work cut out for him, and 
I, I'd love to see them, you know, get that Champions League spot, but I just don't know if if you if push comes to shove, you know, Gladback may defend more poorly than Hertha, but Gladback can also put three or four or five past you when necessary. So it's going to be between Hertha and Gladback, I think, for that fourth spot. So we'll see how they respond. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, John is licking his lips at the prospect of catching and overtaking Hertha. Um, not him personally, of course, but glad back. We'll move on to a game between Schalke and Leverkusen. And I watched this one. Um, it was bizarre, utterly, utterly bizarre. And um, Roberto Martinez. Oh no, sorry, no, he manages Everton. But the um, the <laughs> similarities between him and Brighton writer at Schalke are yeah. amazing. Two 0 up and lost three two. How on earth did Schalke lose this game, which they dominated first half? Honestly, they did dominate in the first half, and a better team might not have scored a third, um, but I don't know if they would have <laughs> leaked three in, in, in the time span that they did. Um, you know, uh, Eric Chupomoding uh, opened the scoring on 14 minutes, and, and then uh, Lee Rassani doubled the lead on the half an hour mark. So if you're a betting man, you'd probably say, you know, Shaka have had their struggles this season, but they should have the type of players that can that can close things out, you know, uh, Johannes Geis, you know, uh, Joel Matip, you know, players like that who um, can contribute in central areas to really kind of shut down players like Chicharito, but they didn't, you know. Uh, Leverkusen came out in the second half and uh, Julian Brandt got got to go back. Kareem Bellarabi leveled matters two minutes later. Four minutes later after that, Chicharito bagged the winner on six minutes. And the funny thing is, actually, Charles Arangis, who's been excellent since coming back from injury for them, playing alongside Sven, uh, Lars Bender, hit the uh, the woodwork twice, so he missed out on a brace. It could have actually been five two Leverkusen, um, and this is just. And we've talked about it before on on the podcast. We've talked about it before um, off air. Um, this is because struggles. You know, teams when it comes to real season for them, sometimes they've been excellent, sometimes they've been really poor. This is a tale of two teams in the same match, and I think that's even better microcosm as what they're struggling with so much. You know, there are a lot of quality players in their team, uh, a lot of players who could go somewhere else and really shine. You know, uh, Max Meyer, uh, again, Johannes Gasper, Mil Holberg is going to have a future with him. You know, Joel Matip is, is uh, moving on and uh, going to a club we don't really like. Um, but these are all players who have quality. And I don't know if it's going to be Bright Runner that needs to take the fall, but he probably should. But a lot of these players, they switch off quickly. Um, and I think for me, that's that's the biggest issue. Um, and again, we can speak to that because of Arsenal players. They, they sometimes drop for the same reason, but it's just tough to figure out what the, the source of the issue is. But for me, this is why they're definitely on the outside looking in. So, um, you know, they sit in seven right now. They're still tied on points with Mainz. Um, they're five ahead of Cologne and Ingolstadt. But um, if I had to put my money on it, I would probably say they're going to miss out on Europe. Yeah, I would happen to agree with you there. And uh, speaking of Mainz, you just brought up there, they faced a, uh, a trip to Eintracht Frankfurt, who are desperate in need of points. Uh, their, their new manager uh, sort of settling things down and, and starting to sort of sh- put his imprint on, on the, uh, the team, maybe, um, and got a victory. Uh, 2-1 victory, Nico Kovac of course the new manager I should say um, massive victory this for, for Frankfurt and they did it from behind as well if you pardon the phrase that was rather unfortunate <laughs> always you always Chris but um, I know that the score wouldn't suggest it you know, you know Eintracht Frankfurt 1-2-1 one, one. Uh, Daniel Brzezinski opened the scoring on 18 minutes and then um, uh, I'm sorry I forget who got the leveler uh, oh um Someone remind me real fast. Anybody? Marco oh, Russ. Russ, Mar- Russ. Marco Russ scored the leveler. And then a Stefan Bell own goal sort of compounded the Mainz problem uh, on 84 minutes. And, and that was the ball game, so to speak, if for an American term. It doesn't even make sense necessarily. But um, the score was suggested, but this was probably Mainz's worst performance of the season because of the importance of getting a result. You know, they wouldn't have necessarily um, – actually, they did have the ball in their court because they, they played on Sunday. So they knew the results that happened around them sans the, the Gladback result. Um, but they knew Hertha lost. Uh, the new Schalke lost. So getting a result here would, have, would see them level with Gladbach on, on 48 points. Just one point off of Hertha. More pressure for Hertha you know, could have definitely played a part. And then uh, they can distance themselves a little bit from uh, from Schalke for that you know, that key sixth place spot. So um, very, very disappointing from them. Um, and this is a match where you could see how much they're missing Yoshinori Muto. Uh, I don't think John Cordoba, you know, he hasn't done 
poorly necessarily, but I don't think he he, he does enough of, of what uh, Muto does. And Muto had that very, very good understanding with uh, Yunus Mala that they relied so heavily on in the first half of the season. Um, and then the likes of uh, Paulo de Blesis and Yaros Imperio, you know, when they're on, they're pretty influential on in the wings, but then when they're off, they're, they're non-existent. And this is one of those matches where they were non-existent, and I think that played a role. Um, and at the back, you know, Loris Karius wasn't all that great. Um, that Stefan Bell own goal will cost them, but, you know, only Julian Baumgartlinger and uh, the aforementioned Brzezinski were really the only ones that, you know, really put in the shift that was required. So um, I know Martin Schmidt's going to be very disappointed. He has a, a much higher standard he holds himself to. So, um, but again, we can see how they'll bounce back with that, but it's not going to do them any favors to make the job any easier, and it's already a difficult one. Absolutely, and I hope Frankfurt stay up just for Alex Meyer because I love him, as we all know. Um, what was the uh, the other results for the weekend? Yeah, uh, Hamburg uh, beat Werder Bremen at home two one. Uh, Stuttgart lost to Borussia Dortmund three uh, nil. SC Cologne beat uh, Darmstadt four one. Kind of a thumper there. Uh, English died one two. Uh, sorry, drew two two at home uh, against Hanover, which is another disappointing result. Um, and then as John mentioned before, uh, the Gladback result, uh, the three one at home against Hoffenheim. So uh, with the t- with that the table, uh, Bayern, you know, three matches left. Seven points clear of Dortmund. Mathematically, they're not champions, but they're going to be. Uh, Dortmund again second on 74. Uh, Bayer Leverkusen third on four, uh, 54. Uh, Hertha fourth on 49. Uh, Gladbach fifth on 48. Mainz uh, and Schalke tied for sixth on 45. And then Werder Bremen sits 16th on 31. Eintracht Fekker sits 17th on 30. And uh, Hanover, again, you know, they'll be going down. Um, not, it's, uh, at this point, it's actually... Uh, it's more or less mathematical at this point now, so they're 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 bottom of the table on 22. Um, and for a match to look out for next week, uh, actually it's Bayer Leverkusen versus uh, Hertha Berlin. That's huge. So yeah, that is, a, that is a massive game, isn't it? When is that? Is that Saturday or Sunday? That's Saturday. Uh, it's the late match. Uh, so yeah, that's the. Uh... Top Spiel, I believe they call that. So yeah, good, good fun. Okay, super. Well, that's um, that's the Bundesliga done for another week. And uh, yes, and oh, midweek. You're right. Yes, sorry, midweek. What have we got uh, midweek? Yeah, uh, Bayern travel to Madrid to play Atletico. Um, I don't know what you really wanted me to say on this. Apart from, I can honestly see Atletico winning this one. Um, I know Tom will attest that they're probably pound for pound one of the toughest if not the toughest team to beat at home and, and you know at the Vicente Calderon uh, and when you compare it uh, Atletico have kept a clean sheet in six of the last eight Champions League matches while Bayern have scored at least two goals in six of the last seven Champions League matches so something is going to have to give in that match um, the, the key though is uh, Atletico really still have their key at, uh, attacking performers available while Bayern are still struggling at the back a little bit you know I know i um, uh, Pep used uh, Medi Benatia and uh, Sardar Tashi at center back uh, uh, on the weekend. But, um, you know, there's rumors that uh, Joshua Kimmich might get a start, or maybe he might even use Javier Martinez as a center back. So it's going to be interesting to see how he mixes and matches his center backs to sort of counter um, you know, the likes of uh, Griezmann and, and Saul Nuguis and, uh, and Fernando Torres and even Koke. So uh, I don't know, it's going to be interesting, but I think Atletico might pull out a, a classic Atletico win and then maybe hopefully try to survive going, making a return leg to Munich. So we'll see. When did yeah. we see the day when we'll be talking about Fernando Torres as a threat again? Right. <laughs> <laughs> what a clash of styles that's going to be as well. Really, it's going to be a clash of styles. So it's do kind of tune in. So. It is, and that's on the Wednesday, isn't it, that game, I think? It so, uh, yeah. Super, super. Okay. Right, well, that's, um, that's Germany done and dusted for another week. It's uh, getting close to the end of the season now. Not much more time to go. Um, so we will um, shift gears and uh, I shall hand over the reins to John. And um, we're going to have a little little French talk. And it's uh, this week's Liga. get on to Liga. Um, we're going to start with, uh, actually not the league, but the Coupe de la Ligue. It was the final uh, this previous weekend. Um, do you want to tell us all about it, Chris? Yeah, I, will. I actually saw uh, bits and then I had to go out and then I had to see more bits and I saw the highlights and I've seen it all now. It's all good. But um, yeah, it, you won't be surprised to know that PSG did win. 
the Coupe de la Ligue. I don't think anyone really expected anything different, but fair play to Lille. They, they put up a real fight. PSG, it's the third straight Coupe de la Ligue. They've beaten Lyon and Bastia in the, in the last two finals, so they are the they are the reigning champions three times over. Um, and uh, that they are kicking butt in this competition, basically. They've actually won the treble the, la- the last season as well, so they could be on for back-to-back trebles now. But uh, And Lille, they're beaten by PSG in last year's semi, whereas this year they were beaten in the final, so they don't really have much luck either. But uh, as far as the game goes, I mean, PSG... To be perfectly honest, they weren't. I didn't think they were that impressive in the game. In truth, um, they, they kind of struggled to get any rhythm. They, they didn't look pretty, very convincing, um, and, and it was just a bit of a slog. But they, they did take the league. Javier Pastore with the goal, just five minutes before half time. He thought, "Oh, what a perfect time to score!" Um, you know, a really good finish from a from a corner that was deflected out to him, and he drilled it low into the net. But uh, Gibra Sidibe, Sidibe, sorry, equalised for Lille just four minutes into the second half with a free kick, um, nicely put into the bottom corner past trap and that was 1-1 and for long periods it looked it looked like Leo was still with the game never more so when Adrian Rabio picked up a second booking and was sent off on 70 minutes and you really thought then if Leo ever had a chance it was now and then they shot themselves in the foot 74th minute long ball punted forward uh, Victor, uh, Vincent Anyama sorry the, the Leo goalkeeper um, did his, his very very best uh, Manuel Amunia impression bless him but um quite what he was doing coming out to, to try and close this ball which bounced probably 10 feet outside the box um, came racing rush of blood didn't get there uh, Angel Di Maria did and popped it into an unguarded and empty net and that was the winner so and Yama who's been so good all season will, will feel like the, the guilty party but um, unlucky for Lille, but PSG lift the silverware and they all get individual little trophies that, that mirror the, um, the the main cup. So it's kind of cute. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised PSG have won it, um, but, but fair play to Lille. They, they put oh, up a really good fight. Yeah, about the little trophy. So we'll have to do that. Now then, uh, back to the league. Obviously, PSG have already won the title, but there's hot competition for the Champions League and Europa League spots. Uh, and we'll go to Toulouse v Lyon. Um, Lyon in been in some resurgent form um and did they keep it up this weekend they did uh, what a game this was my highlight game of the weekend last week and uh, i'm glad i picked the right one because it was an absolute belter it really really was and Toulouse will feel gutted they really really we feel gutted they actually took the lead through uh, tisserand who had an outstanding game despite um, being on a losing side he was fantastic and he actually got to lose in front on 50 minutes that the first half i should say was was largely a bit of cat and mouse and then the second half just exploded with with all five goals but uh, yeah tisserand putting to lose in front um stadium was was bound and it all looked good but Clement Grenier remember him who's uh, rumoured to be of uh, rumoured to be put on the or has been put on the champion Champions League the transfer list um, I was going to say will attract Champions League clubs but uh, yeah got my words tied there but uh, he got the equaliser um, lovely finish actually and, and Alex Lacazette seemingly had won the game for Leon. then 80 minutes he uh, he bagged what, what looked to be the winner but just two minutes later Wissam Ben Yedder who without him to lose would be gone by now uh, got the equaliser 82 minutes and it's and you thought, mm, OK, 2-2, two, two, probably not the result for either side that they wanted or needed. And a uh, certain Nabil Fakir came on for Leon uh, and just gave him that little bit more creative edge. And um, from his sort of individual bit of class on the right hand side, he managed to get the ball across. In came the cross to Liso, who uh, buried it from from five yards for the winner at the back stick. So um, to Liso's winner gives Leon the points. It, it's a massive victory for Leon. Um, it, it's not ideal for Toulouse, obviously. It's actually Toulouse's first home defeat after three straight wins. Um, and you just felt in this game they just switched off a little bit. They just didn't focus when they got back into the game. Um, um, as for Leon, they've they've actually it's a good stat. This they've scored two goals on ball in ten of their last twelve games. Um, so they are a side to watch if you enjoy goals and, and entertainment. They're they're probably the favourites for second place now, uh, due to Monaco's slip, which uh, which we we can come on to next. Almost as if um, getting Lacazette firing again has helped Leon score goals. Who would have thought it? Yeah. Who would have um, thought? Uh, yeah. yeah, as you said. Speaking of Monaco, uh, they had an away trip to Oran. Um, and their away form hasn't been great of late. 
No, no, it hasn't. Um, again, this was another kind of must-win game for probably both sides if, if they're going to going to progress into the, the, the Champions League spots. Um, Monaco probably could afford the result more than, than Ren could, but it ended in a 1-1 draw. And given the circumstances, Ren will probably be quite happy in truth because uh, Monaco were in front in the game. They uh, they took the lead through Helder Costa uh, on 40 minutes and they were fairly comfortable, really. Ren sort of had a couple of attacks but didn't offer a lot until the, the last 10 minutes where Giovanni C popped up with a leveller and it ended in a 1-1 draw which is as I say it's a result that doesn't really suit either but um, but Monaco will probably see it as a point gained um, on the grand scheme of things but equally a point lost given the fact that they, they were leading the game for such a long period of time so it's a little bit of a tough one to, to judge who's happier um, but a um, couple of sort of things just to bring up on uh, on Ren late leveller or 80 minutes at least it's uh, it's the 13th time this season that they've uh, scored beyond the 80th minute which is quite a fun stat given that there's only sort of 35 odd games in this or 38 odd games in the season 13 times late goals so they've got some spirit about them and uh, as for monaco it's only three wins in 12 away from home and that is probably what's going to cost them um, if they don't make champions league uh, whereas it's only one loss in 14 at home so you can clearly see they are a home banker if you're filling out an accumulator oh, well, there you go. Um, now last game we wanted to talk about I assume is uh, some sort of Corsican derby is there a is there a derby name for it Gazalik against Bastia it is definitely a, a, a Corsican derby you're right I don't actually know if there is a name for it I shall have to look that up in, in time for uh, for so next I'll week but yes it, it was terrible <laughs> You have, though you have. There's, there's, there's actually, there's, to be fair, there's a lot of derbies in France, so they've all got very different names. It's much so the same in Italy, it's tough to I keep up. Get them wrong. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I will look that up, though. But um, the most important thing is Gazalek well won. Gazelec. Yay! Um, we're, we're pleased with Gazalek, fans of, of Gazalek on this show. And um, they had to do it the hard way. They were behind to an Engando goal from Bastia on nine minutes, but uh, Boutaib has been one of their star performers, uh, got them level on 20 minutes, and Gregory Pujol put them in front on 37, and Larby got them a penalty, converted on 63 seemed to be going all smooth sailing for a 3-1 up. Uh, Kalzak got one back for Bassa with 15 minutes to play, but they couldn't force the equal. So Gazalek, um, it, it was one of those games, I think I said last week, it was it was a game they absolutely had to win. I think it, I think it might have been another game I said that was worth a watch. Um, they, um, they had to win it, and they did win it, and it's absolutely vital for them. It uh, actually moves them out of the relegation spurs. Yay! So uh, it's only their second win in 17. They, so they do still have a shot at survival. Uh, the running is not great. Great. So it's going to be about how they take this win on. As for Bastia, 43 points. They should be safe now. Um, it is three straight defeats, which is a little bit of a concern because if you look at the table, yes, they are fairly clear, but it only takes a couple of sides below them to win and then to lose a couple more. And they could be slightly looking over the shoulder. So I, I just really, I really hope Gazalaka Jaxio do survive. Their coach has actually been nominated um, as one of the coaches of the season, which on the face of it, you think that that's a little bit of a strange one because given the fact that they're they're struggling so far or, or struggling solo solo down the table, you think oh, that's that's a bit of a strange one for 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 somebody to nominate. But if you look at their budget, we've been over it on this podcast before. Uh, the job that uh, Thierry Laure, their manager, that has done there is is nothing short of a mirac- of a miracle. So um, I hope they stay up and uh, and I love them lots. So good luck yeah, to them. Not not far behind Marseille, and we all know what's going on there. So. I'm sure Gazalek can overtake them. <laughs> no bias, no bias show, crossed, show yeah. at all. Um, do you want to give us the uh, rest no. of the results and the league table then? Yes, again. So uh, other results. Well, uh, as I said, um, with uh, Gazalek getting out of the relegation zone, someone had to drop in, and that team is Ram. They lost two nil to Nice on Friday night. So Nice still keep up their Champions League push. Uh, Germain and uh, yes, you guessed it, Ben Arthur got the goals there. Uh, Marseille uh, still can't win. Bless them. One uh, one draw at home to Nantes. Uh, they had a player sent off, and they had to come from behind to get that draw. So more bad news for them. Uh, Saint Etienne, we've mentioned, beat Lorient two nil. Boo. Unfortunately, Gangon and Khan played out a 1-1 draw Rutterland for Khan and Torbon for Gambon Giras and Sweb actually sent off in that game as well uh, Montpellier thrashed Trois no surprises there 4-1 uh, Roussillon Sonnier Martin and Camera for Montpellier who actually were down to 10 men for the 41st minute as well Darbion got one back for Trois and there is one midweek game still to play which is Lille and Angers because of PSG's uh, PSG Lille's final um, and PSG also have a game to catch up on as well which I think for memory 
is against Bordeaux, I think. Yeah, I don't know when that's going to be played yet. So just now. Good, good stuff. So that'll be uh, that'll be due to be played soon. Uh, as far as the table goes, um, PSG obviously champions, eighty six points. Leon are now second uh, again on fifty nine points, level with Monaco, who are kind of joint second but third on fifty nine points. Leon's goal difference massively, massively above Monaco's tw- plus twenty one for Leon, plus nine for Monaco. Nice and Saint Etienne fourth and fifth on fifty seven points. You can't really rule either of those out. And then Lille. Um, you never know if they win that game in hand 52 points they could still be in with it as well and Ren on can not make up the top 10 down at the bottom Twat gone 17 points relegated to lose are uh, 33 points still in with a shot and 19th Ram down in the relegation zone 36 and then as we mentioned Gazalek just above it on 37 and then you've got Marseille yes Marseille 41 points 16th place in Liga with Bordeaux Bastia Lorient Gangon Montpellier making up the bottom half there um so that is the table. Would you like a little bit uh, of news? Yeah, give us a bit of news and a game to look out for. Cool. Two very, very quick bits of news from Ligue 2, which we don't do very often. Uh, Nancy and Dijon are up. They are both promoted to Ligue 1. They are going up. Uh, Nancy actually confirmed their passage with a 1-0 victory over Sosho tonight. And uh, Dijon, um, they actually secured qualification on, on Friday without even having to play. Luckily for them, because they then lost to Osea on Saturday, so they're probably partying a bit too hard Friday night. But those two are both going to be in Ligue 1 next season. And the other bit of news is that the Nantes coach, um, Michel de Zacharin, is, uh, he's going to resign at the end of the season. Um, he's, uh, he's decided that enough is enough for him. Um, hasn't really given too much or given the reasons as to why, but I think he just has decided that he wants to move on. So he's going to call it a day. And as far as a game to look out for goes, I have picked out two. I know, I know, I broke the rules. St. Etienne to lose. And Leon Gazalek Ajaxio. Um, so let Etienne to lose for obvious reasons. And Etienne pushing Champions League to lose, need to win to stay out of the bottom three. And same reasons for Leon Gazalek. Uh, massive fixture for both. So worth a look for both Good of those games. Stuff. Uh, well, I'll hand it all back over to you then. Why, thank you. Why, thank you. Right, let's uh, move on to our final country of interest then. And that is Spain. We're coming over to Tom for this week's La Liga. All right then, Tom. We're going to start with uh, Real Madrid, Rayo Vallecano, whichever way you want to look at it. Is wait, Rayo? Wait, 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 wait. We've got oh, midweek games. Sorry. Well, I, I try, I try, I keep forgetting we have midweek games. We'll come back to Rayo Real Madrid after we've done midweek <laughs> games. And so, go on. What do we have? What do we have in midweek? Okay, so my boys Espanol uh, got a well fought draw at home to Espan at uh, home to Espanol uh, at home to Celta Vigo one one was the score. Uh, Real Betis beat Las Palmas one nil. Quite a surprising result. Deportivo. Didn't really use their draw trap very well. Very well, they lost to uh, Barcelona eight nil at home. Um, yeah, uh, Valencia beat Ibar four nil. Bit a bit of a turnaround there. Sporting Gijon beat Sevilla two one. Still no away win for Sevilla all season. Athletic Bilbao lost at home to Atletico Madrid one uh, nil. Malaga drew one with Rio. Real Madrid beat Villarreal three nil at home. Real Sociedad lost at home two one to Hatafe. A uh, big result, that one. And Granada, another huge result. 5-1 win against Levante. So what you want to take from that is the top three all won, all doing their job. So quite a lot of pressure was on all three of them going into this weekend. Right, sorry, I jumped ahead there. I do apologise. Now we'll come on to the weekend's games. Um, so Real, Real Madrid. Now, obviously, with the situation at the top of the table, with all three teams in with a shot, everyone has to keep winning. Um, mm. Real Madrid had to do this uh, in the unorthodox fashion, coming from two behind. They did, and uh, it was it was certainly not a game I expected to go the way it did. Raya were very, very unpredictable under Pacahemes, but uh, it was it was a great game to watch. And as you say, Raya went two 0 up. Um, they, Ronaldo didn't play in this game. Hesse started in his place, and and Raya did start on the front foot. Bale hit the post very early on, but on seven minutes, Bebe's low cross found in Barber, who had an easy finish to make it one nil. And then even more surprisingly, Raya then doubled their lead. Uh, a corner was poorly defended by the Real defence. And um, Ku, of all people, stabbed in on 14 minutes uh, to make it 2-0. So Real Madrid really on the rocks at this point. Uh, really not really clicking. Defending was really quite bad, especially a bit worrying going into Champions League football in the witty midweek. Um, 
but they got back with a blip header from Bale from a cruise corner uh, to make it 2-1. Second half round, Real pushed and pushed for a leveller, and it did come seven minutes into the half. Danilo's cross was also headed in, another headed goal, which was fantastically done by Lucas Vasquez. And for me, Lucas Vasquez this season has really stepped up. I mean, he's on loan at Espanyol and has come into the first team, and it really hasn't looked out of place. Come off the bench a lot, but uh, he's really, really done well from this season, and he got the, the leveller in the game. And um, the longer the game went on, I was like, Real aren't getting back this. They're going to be at the title race all over. And then when you don't have Ronaldo, uh, it's going to be other, other man to step, isn't it? Mr. Bale, and uh, he got his second goal. Really poor play from Raya, giving the ball away in midfield, and, and Bale ran through them with ease and, and, and slotted home to finish. So it finished 3-2, and, and Zidane will be happy, but there are many, many concerns from the game he will have to do something about. Mm, absolutely. It's um, entertaining, uh, at least, but uh, sure. yeah, good, good result. Let's um, move on to another team, then, Levante. Um, who are kind of all the way down at the other end of the table, down at the bottom, yeah. fighting for their lives. They had a tough-looking home game against Athletic Club or Athletic Bilbao, and it all seemed to be going so well, and then... I'll let you finish the sentence. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, so I'll start with the all going so well. Uh, Levante began very well and, and took the lead early on in 30 minutes. Casadejo um, timed his attempt perfectly to get it past the right hold, the uh, Bilbao goalkeeper. Um, Levante held on um, until the 68th minute, but then Bilbao scored. But it was in their own goal. Um, Exeter uh, re- really quite weirdly put in a Morales cross and that made it 2-0 to Levante. And uh, the three points looked pretty safe uh, 88 minutes into the match when you 2-0 up at home. You think, yeah, I think we've got three points here, lads. But no, a certain hipster's choice player, Iñaki Williams, uh, got involved at the right time, passing across to Susayeta, who made it 2-1. And then four minutes later, Iñaki Williams, another cross, found San Jose in the box, and he stabbed home to make it 2-2. Uh, the goalkeeping, Marino, was, was really quite a fault there. It was, it was He really should have got a stronger hand to it. Um, but it finished 2-2, and to be honest, even even though there was a comeback from Bilbao, it's not a result either team wanted. It was uh, really to throw away two goals like that late on. They must be yeah, absolutely... Yeah, relegation good. form, yeah. That was huge. Because yeah. those two points, well, I mean, that would have really tightened it up. Here. They, they would have been on 31 points, and that would have been like one point. Uh, that would have been two points off safety, so... Yeah. Gutted, gutted. Never mind. Um, let's move on to Sevilla, who played at Betis. Uh, this was a game I watched, actually. Um, Sevilla's home form once again coming to the fore. It did. It's the Seville derby, and um, basically the, the reverse fixture was this at, at Betis' ground was a nil-nil, which wasn't really a football match. It was more of a rugby match of teams deciding to kick the hell out of each other. Um, but uh, thankfully, that wasn't the case. Um, I'm sure you had fun watching the first half, Chris, where literally nothing happened. <laughs> it was so, dead. Yes, it was definitely the second half did pick up. Um, Betis did the first bit of pressing Sahuda. I'm, I'm sure you saw this. Had an uh, really did take it on the half turn and, and smashed it. Uh, but Rico did break away. Uh, Vesterman then had a half chance on the half volley, uh, but just hit it wide. Uh, Severe pushed and pushed. Can Krasariak had a header from a corner, put just wide. But then on 67 minutes, there's only one man that Severe at the moment is going to put them in the lead, and that's that man, Kevin Gamero, uh, heading a great spotted cross from from Nzonzi, uh, ex Stoke player of all people, and uh, and that got them in the lead. Um, and then the goal of the weekend for me in, in Spain came. Um, it was the two defenders combining, which is for me what made it the goal of the weekend because it was such a surprising pair that did it. Uh, the the, the centre back Carico laid off uh, a bit of a veteran in Sevilla, Coque. Uh, the I spelt the C, not the same Atletico uh, K. And uh, his first time out the side of the boot shot flew past Adan on the left hand side of the goal to make it 2 0 and seal the points. Betis had a chance at the end through Castro, but he shot wide. And uh, Betis will really be ruining those early missed chances. Hell of a goal from Koke. Actually, I really enjoyed watching oh, that one. Yeah. Hell of a strike. And Carioca, that's the extra Reading boy, isn't it, if I'm not mistaken? I, uh, think. I think so. Yeah, I think you might have a point there. But yeah. I'll have to check that. I don't want to say something. You, the last time you did that, you said that Bill Bowden and someone else was a, was a derby. So. <laughs> I, su- I suggested it. You merely confirmed it. Yeah, but I don't want to go against our fearless lead. I can't do that. <laughs> no, no, Daniel Carico is indeed X Reading. So, yeah. Oh, okay. He only had one season there, but uh, yes, he is indeed. So, OK, uh, right, let's go on to our final game then. And this was uh, Getafe. I was going to say Getafe. I don't know to do a Danny. Um, <laughs> another game that I watched, uh, which was um, quite an entertaining game, ended mm-hmm. in a 2-2 draw. Um, a result that probably favours Valencia slightly more, would you say? 
Yeah, especially on the games. I think Valencia will be disappointed. I mean, of all of all the teams they need to come up against, Atafa have been really poor this season. Um, Atafa need all the points they can get, being in the bottom two now. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was started well for Valencia. They took the lead, and and if, if Valencia are going to get a goal, it's normally going to come from Perejo free kick, and it did. <laughs> and uh, that took until the 60th minute to occur, uh, for for Atafa to get level. Um, Valencia really couldn't clear. A bit of a mix-up in the box now. Varo Madran shot found its way in eventually. Diego Alves again at fault. Um, but uh, the man Abdenor. Now this man's come from Monaco in the summer, and I thought he was going to be all right. But uh, this season he's been poor, and again was at fault uh, for the Hatafe putting them in the lead. He, he went for a header that was a pass laid on by Moy Gomez, and Skipovic ran onto it, headed it past him. And then a fine finish past Alves to make it 2-1. And they probably thought they got the points. But in the 84th, 84th minute, the power man, Negredo, ran through their defence and, and set up Alcacer. And Alcacer finished really well in the end to make it 2-2. So, as I say, it's, it, it's a result that Valencia will be happy with coming back from 2-1 down. But Hatafe will be definitely be disappointed they couldn't get the, the three points. And for me, I'm a bit happy because uh, a certain Espanyol uh, really didn't need that to be a win. A goal from Skefan Skepkovic, the Celtic yeah. man on loan as well. Yeah, superb. OK, um, so other results then. Uh, we left out Atletico and Barcelona, so we'll uh, ram those into the roundup as well. What's the other results? You know, we can't go with the big boys every week, so yeah. No, so. no, I can't. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, my boys, Espanyol, this was my game to watch because I thought that Espanyol would go to Las Palmas, put on a really good performance and try and fight away relegation. I know that Las Palmas has been in good form, but they lost to Betis in midweek. But no! They decided to go and lose 4-0, um, which was great for me, my flatmates, to be laughing at me, which I've got them into Spanish football this season, which I didn't enjoy at all. Elzar, Jonathan Vieira, big ass, and, and Vacasso who scored a great goal, uh, getting all the goals in the game. Um, Atletico, um, they kept up their title charge with a really battling 1-0 home performance against Malaga. Yes, Chris, they're back to the 1-0 wins. <laughs> so substitute Correa got the goal there, really quite excellent finish. Um, Barcelona seemed to be back on the track as well uh, after getting f- four goals to Suarez in midweek here when they got four goals again, uh, this time at home to Sporting Gijón. Um and Messi and Neymar, of course, the other players who got the other two goals. Um, so that was good. you have to think that Sporting Gijón have taken three points off Atletico this season, so it's a, a better result than some may see. Um, but Deportivo redeployed their draw trap that they couldn't do against Barcelona, uh, against Ibar away. Adrian got Ibar the lead, but then Cartabia got Depor at that point in the 75th, 71st minute. Um, Villarreal played at a 0-0 goalless draw against host dad really wasn't one to watch and I unfortunately did um, but uh, yeah not great fun what to watch but tonight's game Celta Vigo played at home to Granada and Celta came out 2-1 winners Iago Aspas got both goals interspersed with an El Arabi finish as well and that's the results Super duper. And where are we as far as um, standings and whatnot goes? Yeah, so as we mentioned at the top, it's it's no changes for the top three. Barcelona are on 82, Atletico on 82, but Barcelona are head-to-head advantage. Real Madrid are on 81, and then Villarreal's uh, draw means they're 20 points from Real Madrid in third now on 61 points. And in fifth, Celta Vigo with their win. I've gone above Bilbao into fifth. Uh, on 57 points now. Uh, down at the bottom, Levante's draws taken up to 29, but that wasn't enough to change any positions. Still in 20th. Atafe are on 32. Sporting Hihon are also on 32, uh, with a superior head-to-head record. Granada on 33 and 17th. And Rio, uh, unfortunately, couldn't get their win, which would have taken them higher than Espanyol to 15th, but sit in 35 points on 16th. So uh, I'm getting a little bit worried, but uh, I think we should get a win. Yes, yes, all getting a little bit tense, a little bit tense. Mm. Um, now, midweek, you've got, uh, Drew's obviously touched on the Atletico mm. game with Bayern, and you've also got uh, Real Madrid and Man City. Do you fancy an all-Spanish final? Oh, I'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just you know, ego would be brilliant at that moment. But uh, no, I, I'd love to see it. Uh, Atletico won't be pleased with the draw they got. I don't think they would have wanted Bayern, even with some of their defensive flaws they got at the moment. Um, I think they would much would have preferred Real, especially considering the results they've had against us this season. Um, Real got the draw they wanted. Uh, Man City was obviously the easiest tie of the lot, even with a great performance uh, against PSG. But uh, I think I think it will be if I'm going to put if I'd put money on it and. Don't tell my missus, but I'm a gambling man and uh, I would put money on it being a Spanish final. But uh, I think Real will find it harder than they might think it will with Ronaldo a bit dodgy on fitness. But uh, I think over two legs, Atletico will come through against Bayern. Um, I think the away goals could be a big thing. 
um, with them hoping not to concede at home. So uh, I don't know what Drew thinks about that, but uh, that was my take. So, yeah. Yeah, should be, uh, as I said earlier, that clash of styles could be quite interesting. So we will uh, we will indeed be across those on the satchel, either one or two episodes. I'm not sure how many we're doing yet. Um, right, game for next week. What are we looking at? Uh, I get, I'm going to go with Espanyol again. Um, they're at home to Sevilla, and Sevilla haven't won away all season. So I know in my luck, they probably will get their first win away win of the season at Espanyol. But uh, it's the team that they really need to play at home, seeing if, if that away form. So uh, hopefully we can get three points, and that should see us safe. Absolutely, and I should say, is there a Europa League this week as well? Yes, Villarreal are playing Liverpool. Um, Shakhtar. No, Liverpool and um, sorry, Sevilla are playing Shakhtar. So, yeah. cool, good. So, uh, yeah, again, could be on Spanish final there as well. So, yes, interesting, interesting. Okay, so uh, that's uh, another whistle stop tour across the uh, across our leagues as we uh, as we're famed for doing on this pro- on this parish. So, any questions as usual, do ping them across to our hipsters. We'll be um, very happy to answer them. Now, uh, we had a request this week, uh, which segues rather nicely into our next section, which uh, I'm going to announce who the request is from shortly, because it's this week's Best of the Rest. Now, we had a request from uh, our good friend Jimmy, who's at NN Guna, and he messaged me uh, last week and he said, uh, could we do a best of the rest section on Ireland? So ask and you shall receive, Jimmy. We will indeed. So the Irish Premier Division, uh, it's kind of in its early stages. They've only played nine games. They've got sort of different timescales to a lot of the other leagues. But uh, I can give you a little bit of a rundown of where we are and hopefully you'll be able to pronounce the names of the teams. It's always a bonus. So uh, currently Dundalk are top of the, uh, of the, the Premier league they've played nine one seven drawn one lost one 22 points uh the last few last five games four wins and a draw they're on fire uh derry city are second uh they've got uh, 20 points and in third cork city on 18 points and then you've got galway st patrick's athletic and shamrock rovers in the top six and then down at the bottom longford town who weirdly i vaguely remember uh, a certain man uh, by the name of Vast Blog, um, somebody we'll all be familiar with. Pretty sure he used to follow Longford Town. I'm sure he did. Well, they're bottom anyway, five points, and they're joined by Wexford Youths. Um, I don't think they are a youth team, but they're down at the bottom on five points. Then you've got Bray Wanderers and Sligo Rovers on seven points, just above the drop zone at the moment. And then the Bohemians, Finn Harps make up the other two positions in eighth and seventh, respectively. Uh, f- this is always good fun. Top scorers in the Irish division at the moment. Well, a chap called Fahati, as a nice Irish name for you. He plays for Galway United, um, who, uh, being in fourth position, he scored seven league goals already this season. Five of them, uh, five of them are from uh, from first goals as well. So, as in kickoff goals in the game. So, rather good there. And uh, a chap by the name of Fagan. Uh, it's he's actually called Christy Fagan. Lovely name there. He plays with St Patrick's. He's got he's got six goals as has Finn of Dundalk. So your your top scorers there. And uh, disciplinary wise, well, a chap called Rodan of uh, Sligo Rovers. He's got four bookings and a red card already. They've only played nine games. Goodness gracious me! So uh, that's where the uh, that's where it stands at the moment. And uh, as far as the, um, the sort of fixtures go, well, this week you've got uh, Dundalk, the leaders. They're away at Bohemians, um, so you'd like to think that they'll probably get a win there. And uh, Derry City, uh, they're at home to Sligo Rovers. You'd also expect them to probably win that game as well. So there we go. There's your little Irish update. And uh, I feel like I should do some sort of jig, but I, I can't do that on radio. So it's not going to work. So there you go, Jimmy. There is your Irish update from this week's Best of the Rest. OK, then let's move it on. And uh, we're going to go to our next section, which is this week's Hipster's Choice. OK, 
Okay, now we uh, we put a poll out actually this week on our, our Twitter account because I wanted to get kind of a feel for what people thought of the hipster's choice, and uh, it, it's kind of a bit of a fine split between those of you that love it and those of you that skip it. So uh, if if you want to skip it, now is the time. Um, but hopefully, hopefully you'll stick with us because um, we we really enjoy doing these, and it, it's good fun to to sort of learn about new players and uh, get sort of our hipsters uh, hipsters views on them. And it's always nice when a player that we pick out. Um, who we think is going to actually do something actually turns out to be quite good. So uh, there we go. So with that said, this week we're going to go for a man who plays in France. So I know him well. And it's Bernardo Silva. So Bernardo Silva, of course, plays for Monaco. And what do we know about him? Well, his full name is actually Bernardo Mota Vega de Carvalho e Silva. It's quite a mouthful, so you can see why he calls himself Bernardo Silva. He's 21 years of age, born on August the 10th, 1994. He's Portuguese by nationality. Five for eight, 141 pounds. He's Monaco's number 10. He's left-footed and he plays with the Adidas X15 silo boots. You can find him on YouTube. I tweeted a, a little link on our Twitter account earlier on, so do have a look at that. You can stalk him on Twitter at Bernardo C. Silva, and you can stalk him on Instagram, Bernardo Carvalho Silva as well. His, uh, his, his interesting bits and bobs then. He was born in Lisbon. Uh, he's yet another product of the Benfica youth system, uh, which we've covered at length before. In 12-13, he garnered the attention as part of Benfica's youth team that won the Portuguese junior championship and he earned a place in the Benfica B squad for the 13-14 season where he made 38 appearances, scored 7 goals and he was the name Segunda Liga Breakthrough Player of the Year and last season on the 19th of October 2013 or also that season, I should say, Bernardo Silva made his debut for Benfica's first team, aged just 19, in the Taca de Portugal 1-0 victory over Sinfales, or Sinfias, coming on the bench, coming off the bench and the 80th minute. And he made two additional appearances for Benfica's first team in their Trevor winning season, uh, once in the Primera Liga and once in the Taca de la Liga. Uh, on August 7th, 2014, he joined Monaco on a one-year loan deal, but featured sporadically in the first half of the season. Although he made 15 league appearances, they were mostly off the bench. Despite limited playing time, he scored two league goals and his talent was pretty obvious. So Monica pulled the trigger on securing him permanently in January 2015 for 15.75 million euros on a contract till 2019. And he would go on to make a total of 17 league appearances in the 14-15 season, score seven goals this season. He's made 29 appearances, 19 starts. He's scored six goals. He usually plays on the right-hand side of midfield in their 4-2-3-1 system, although he has played in the centre or on the left sometimes and uh, as a right forward as well in the 4-3-3 formation. So he's quite versatile. He's, uh, he's slight. Uh, the Portuguese playmaker is actually as weak as he looks at 5 foot. Sorry, he's not as weak as he looks. At 5 foot 8, he's got uh, quite a spindly frame. He's uh, not particularly winning headers or marginal physical duels. So he is kind of your nippy in and out kind of player. Doesn't like the physical side as much. However, as a continental playmaker, he's clever enough with his feet to overcome disadvantages of his small frame. And he possesses great stamina and use it to track back and press. Something often uh, devoid in a traditional number 10. Most impressively, his uh, skills are a sublime first touch and dribbling ability and his ability to control almost any type of ball and weave effortless patterns through defences. And not surprisingly, his two football idols are Rui Costa and Zidane. That's two pretty good idols to have, I would suggest. And he's described as terrier, as a terrier-like mantra. And he also looks remarkably like Zorro, um, which is actually very true when I look that up. Uh, irritating for opponents, but perhaps the reason that he's accumulated seven yellow cards this season. Uh, as far as internationally, he's represented Portugal at the 2013 UEFA Under-19 Football Championship and was named among the top 10 talents under the age of 19 in Europe, which is quite the uh, quite the accolade. And he's also represented, represented sorry, Portugal in the Under-21 Championships, making 13 appearances for the Under-21, scoring six goals. And on March 2015, he... in Sorry, on March 31st, 2015, he made a senior debut for Portugal, starting in a 2-0 friendly defeat to Cape Verde in Estoril. He has five senior caps. Finally, his stats for this season. So he's uh, had the 29, 29 appearances, 19 starts. That's 1,997 minutes, six goals, one assist, seven yellow cards, no red cards. Averages 27 passes per game. At a success rate of 82.5%. It also averages 1.3 shots per game and 1.6 dribbles. He's been man of the match four times in, uh, in Ligue 1 this season. And his average WhoScored.com rating is 7.0. 
So there we go. That is Bernardo Silva, another one done and dusted and into our archive of Hipster's Choices. As usual, if you do want to listen back to them and you are one of that percentage that enjoys these, you can go to our website, click on the Hipster's tab and there's a time check. So you can actually go back and listen to any of the players we've covered previously any time. Now, I know uh, our panel probably haven't seen a lot of, of Bernardo Silva. So uh, I think it would be a good um, a, a good kind of uh, way to just ask them about what they think of of a diminutive number 10 that can play anywhere across the lines and, and where he might suit. So I'm simply going to ask you guys to uh, to all name one side you think he would fit into in your respective leagues and why. So I'll start with I'll start with Drew uh, in the Bundesliga. Drew, is there any sort of players uh, that you could think he's comparison to that you think he could fit the style of and a team that maybe he could join? Uh, well, I'm trying to think. Pers- I mean... If it was Pep at Bayern, you could see him there because you know you could probably maybe compare him a little bit to Kingsley Coman in, in the same fashion. But um, I feel like he he could even do a, a Bayer Leverkusen. Um, but he has to be sort of in a system where the in an attacking sense the manager will help put faith in him and just let him run and do his thing. Um, a lot of other clubs like you know uh, Dortmund are, are way more responsible under uh, Tuchel than they were under Klopp so I don't know if he would fit there um, they have more of a, a nailed down system but um, anywhere where he could play free and, and just affect proceedings how he sees fit and, and to use his level at his age um, and his intelligence uh, to, to do things on his own I think would, be, would suit him so I would say like you know like a Bayern or a Bayern Leverkusen probably those two I think would stand out Interesting. And um, Tom, where do you think he would fit in La Liga, if if indeed anywhere? Uh, it's, it's really tricky because I'm trying to think of teams that play a sort of free roaming system. Um, it, it, it might come across as a bit of an insult to his ability, uh, but I, I'm thinking of Malaga for some reason because of the way they play their attacking midfielders in such a free form with like Juan P and Chop and whatever. So I think it would sort of fit in that sort of system more than it would say a higher up club like Villarreal or, or, or Villarreal Sevilla because it's more of a set like a uh, formation system where uh, everyone knows their job rather than the free form sort of thing. Um, of any player in the top level he reminds me of is sort of Isco because Isco can play across any of the front three to attack him in field line and in quite a free form place and, and can stick to his position. So sort of a comparison player for me is, would, would be him. Good shout. And uh, John, he's been linked with Juventus. Uh, is that the club you would uh, you would put him at if he was to move on, or do you think there's a better fit somewhere um, else? I actually think he'd fit better at Napoli, to be honest. Um, I just think the system they play and the sort of technical player that he is, he'd play perfectly well there. Um, he reminds me a little bit of Imar, actually, um, from what I've seen of him. Mm. Uh, he's that sort of style. Um, I think if he had more adds more goals to his game, then... Um, then he, he could, well, definitely that comparison will be a, be a fit. But he's got a long way to go. But um, yeah, he's a really exciting player. Whenever I've seen him, I really liked him. Mm, absolutely, I, uh, I I can see him moving on from league on this season. But he's a player I I really really like, and he's he's a joy to watch. So definitely one to keep an eye on. And uh, I could even see a certain Mr. Guardiola at Manchester City having a little look at him because he fits that sort of style. We shall see. Right. OK. Uh, thank you, as usual, to uh, to Kelly for compiling our notes for us. Much appreciated to you. Right. One more section to go and we will leave you to your lives. And this week's Onion Bag is up next. OK, then. So this is the part where we take a couple of your questions and see whether we can get them answered. Uh, just a couple this week. And then we've got a little bit of homework to catch up on from last week. Our first question that comes from uh, Cashod Cashod, our good friend. And it's one for you, Tom. It says he says, sorry, it looks like Atletico Madrid can focus on the semi-final of the Champions League. But will Barcelona and Madrid slip up to give them a La Liga? Uh, I don't think they can just focus on the Champions League. I, uh, at the end of the day, those top three have got to win all their matches if they want any shout of, of winning the league. Um, do I think Real and Barcelona? I think Real have shown against Rio that there's possibly they could slip up. I'm less certain on Barcelona with the recent form of um, 14 goals in two matches and eight in two for Suarez. So, and seeing as they've got games against teams in the bottom half only. They've got the easiest sort of run in. Um, I think Atletico are the team who could go on to win the, the Champions League. And uh, I, I think Simeone would, if he's going to prioritise either and he thinks he's got a shot at the Champions League, he's definitely going to go for that. So, yeah. Absolutely. Good shout. Uh, next question we had was from Alexi uh, Otonen. 
Uh, good, good name, that Lex. You like it. Uh, he wants to ask me, actually, um, what more can Lacazette do to convince Didier Deschamps he should be the number one striker in the Euros or at least get in the team? Good question, Alexi. I think he will go. I think he'll go to the Euros. Um, I also think he'll be moving on. Less said about that, but the better at the moment. But uh, I think he'll go in the squad. I, I just think that Deschamps, he's, he's a very, um, very stubborn manager um, and he likes things his way. And uh, I have a feeling that he'll probably stick with a, a target man, which is why Olivier Giroud will probably be the man that he goes with, particularly with with Benzema's absence. Um, I know uh, a lot of people think that that's a very odd choice, but if you look at what he's got behind him, uh, the likes of Griezmann and and Coman, uh, it could be maybe Fakir might still go. Um, ben Arfa could go. There's a lot of attacking talent that that essentially plays off of the front man. So, and uh, although Giroud has not been in great form for Arsenal, he's uh, he's in very good form as far as France goes because he sticks their system that they play a lot better. So um, I think Lacazette will go, um, but expect him to have the sort of Thierry Henry World Cup 98 role where he comes on and just has a, a few bits and bobs here and there. But I can see him playing his way into the team. And if he gets a goal early on, he could well get a chance. So stay tuned. But uh, yeah, good question that. Uh, job one for you from our very own Danny. Uh, God bless him. If you haven't heard him and Ross on the breakfast show last night, in my absence, do listen. It was excellent. Danny wants to know, John, how close is Totti to becoming the best Serie A player in the modern era, 80s to now, he says. Oh, well, uh, it, that's really tough to call. There's, I mean, there's so many to pick from. Um, I suppose if you're talking about Italians, he's basically up there competing with... Uh, Maldini, Pirlo, Buffon, um, they're all greats. I think the, the the one thing that you always hold out the difference with Totti is is that he's been at one club his entire career and he's got that the uh, you know the the most caps, most goals for Roma, youngest captain in Serie A ever, um, which is just incredible. Uh, you know, and he he could have gone to like Real Madrid and Barcelona and you know he's had offers from teams all over the world and he never wanted to leave Roma and you know and other teams within Italy as well um, so I think that whether that makes him the best or not it is a different argument but I think that maybe makes him the most special in that way and he's, he's sort of he's, he's universally loved by everyone yeah, it's, you know, some players can be great and disliked. Say, like uh, Ronaldo is very popular with Madrid and Man United fans, but fans of other clubs don't particularly like him. They might agree that he's a great talent and one of the best footballers in the world, but they they don't share that com- sort of compassion for him. Uh, whereas with Totti, I think everyone really likes him. Um, so, yeah, he's he's definitely up there as probably the most special. I just want to say at this point, Danny's got a follow-up question. I just want to say at this point, um, when somebody listens to this, which I'm sure they will listen to this, and they'll know who they are, um, congratulations, I did indeed get rickrolled. You know who you are. Um, The second part of Danny's question (laughs) is... is. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Um, the second part of Daddy's question was about Gigi Donnarumma, John, who I know you rate very highly, and he just wants to know very quickly, do you think Milan will stick with him or will they ship him on because uh, he thinks he could be the new Buffon? It's quite a, quite a, sty- uh, quite a uh, um, statement, that. But do you think Milan will retain him or do you think they'll oh, try no, and replace no, they'll, him? They'll definitely try and keep him. Um, if it wasn't for Donnarumma, then Milan would be further down the table than they already are. Not that they're not horrendously doing uh you know they're not doing horrendously this year but they they should certainly be higher up the table um but if it wasn't for him they'd have dropped a lot more points so no he he'll be staying there unless a you know it'd have to be a very very big offer to come in for him because um he's certainly one of one of if not the best uh goalkeeping prospect uh across europe right now Absolutely. Might be going to the Euros as well, possibly with Perrin's injury. We shall see. Um, Right. Final two questions. One for me and one for Drew. Drew, I'll give you yours first. It comes from both of these questions come from Mark, um, our our West Ham supporting friend. Um, He wants to know about Dortmund. He said, what do they need to do to go to the next level to be with Bayern next season? Uh, One of the things is stop selling their players to Bayern. That's one thing. Um, But honestly, (laughs) honestly, it's difficult because, you know, Dortmund, they, they don't have the pull that Bayern has. You know, Bayern is as close to a perfectly run football club that you can get from top to bottom. Um, you know, they, they have the prestige. They're always going to be not only the favorite to win the Bundesliga, but they're always going to be in the conversation for can they make a run to the Champions League final. Dortmund, I feel like if they get a more consistent, 
European reputation, where if they continuously make quarterfinals um, of Champions League and maybe even push that up to semifinals eventually, a couple appearances here and there, that'll help. Um, they're not really cash trapped, so that's not an issue. You know, they're going to rely on their youth system also in the next year or two. They've got a lot of good young players coming through. Um, but again, I just think like especially under Tuchel, who is, isn't afraid to show faith in youth, which is what he's done with Christian Pulisic and uh, Felix Paslak this season. He'll do with a couple more next season. Um, unfortunately, they can never outspend Bayern, and because of that Bayern pull, I don't think they're going to be able to close the gap as quickly as they would like, but I also don't think they're trying to. I feel like their project as a club is always going to be more longer term. You know, Bayern has already been at that level for years. Dortmund are not trying to solidify themselves at the current level and then push on to the next one. So it's going to, it's, it's a tough process. So, yeah. yes, you can make a note of this now if you want, because I'll probably look really foolish. I think if Shell could get the right manager next and uh, with Dortmund, with Tuchel and with Bayern, with Ancelotti, I think you're going to get a three way title race next year. So there you go. Calling it now. Calling it now. With Schalke's money and the opportunity of, a, of the right manager, I think they can um, push on. We shall see. Um, I'm sure that will come back and bite me sometime. Final question uh, also from Mark then was to me, do you worry about the quality of the league in Liga next season with big stars set to leave? And he notes here Ibrahimovic, Lacazette and Cavani. Um, Cavani's not a big star. <laughs> I'm only joking. Uh, do I worry? Mm, yeah, yes and no. I mean, the truth is, uh, the truth is, Mark, I mean, yes, Liga is probably the, the, the lesser of, of the big five leagues. That's that's true. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. That's just the way it is. The one thing I would say is I still think France has, has probably got the best uh, set of youngsters coming through, other than Portugal, um, who've got a hell of a group coming through at the moment with Benfica. Um, don't start, Canton, don't start. But... Um, <laughs> Just an opinion. But um, no, I, I think the game will always struggle. But there's enough stars still there. Uh, and, and also you, you've got quite a few young players who are becoming stars who will still be in Liga next season um, and when you've got a team with the likes of money that Mar- that uh, Marseille have got if they can get their ownership right um, you've also got obviously the money that Monaco could spend if they decide to and PSG of course I think there'll be enough stars in that league um, we'll, we'll just have to see but it's a good question and uh, I'll still be watching no matter what so you know it's all good right okay before we leave you we were set some homework last week uh, and I should say at this point as well, I think, uh, Drew, I think you were talking to Korosh and someone else who wanted to talk about, uh, they wanted to talk about a couple of players. And I, I think it's something to do with, I think it's about Nkulu and someone else. We will save that. So um, if you're listening, Korosh, and you want to ask that question, um, ping it to us in a question and we'll try and get that in next week. Because I know you did tweet Drew about it, so we'll try. Um, but we were set some homework and this homework was, uh, who was it from again? It was Gunnar Outpost, wasn't it? Gunnar Outpost, I think. Gunnar yeah. Outpost, yes. So he sent us a, a question. And uh, as we always say to our listeners, if you want to set some homework, feel free and we'll do our best um, in way of building teams. And his question for us was to build a team of 11 players that we saw as up and comers in in our league. Uh, John, I'm going to start with you with a Serie A team. So who did you put together to it for an um, 11? I thought this would be quite hard, but I managed to stumble it together. Uh, no surprises. There's uh, Donnarumma in goal, um, a back three of Regani, Mario, and a name I'm about to butcher. Uh, Economu. That's... Yeah, that's, Economu. That's, yeah, that, that, that fella. <laughs> uh, that's the uh, Greek... Greek player from uh, from Bologna. Uh, yeah. He's known as yeah, Barry, Barry to his yeah, mates. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm terrible. Um, two other players from Bologna as well, uh, Godfrey Donsa and Amadou Diawara. Um, interestingly, both linked with moves away from Syria. Um, the two sort of attacking midfielders, uh, Lamina and Cataldi. Um, then uh, Milinkovic Savic, uh, the young Serbian, uh, really exciting player. And up front, uh, Niang and uh, one of your favourites, Chris Bellotti. Oh, Velocity. I do like Niang as well, actually. So, yeah, good. Nice, nice. Uh, Tom, what did you come up with for us from Spain? Um, yeah, so the, the, the league with the best up and coming. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go there. Um, start. Uh, so, in goal, I've gone for Paul Lopez of Espanol. Uh, great in real life. Um, it's been a bit rubbish for my and my, my flatmates' FIFA team. Um, more on that after off, off air. Uh, but uh, right back, I've got Cancelo. Uh, from Valencia, centre backs ba- Eric Bailey from Villarreal, great up and coming centre back, and Lucas Hernandez, who's the understudy to Diego Godin at uh, Atletico Madrid at the moment. Uh, left back, the young and exciting uh, left back Marin from Villarreal, 
Uh, really got a good future ahead of him, that guy. Uh, in centre midfield, midfield three of uh, Thomas Partey, Atletico Madrid, big, strong midfielder. Uh, quite different variety at Atletico Madrid, it's good to see. Um, Halilovic, uh, Swing He on live from Barcelona. That kid is going to go and do big things in the future. Uh, and the, the cam of the, of the three, I've gone for Ajeta at uh, Bilbao. Been playing in the second teams, been promoted to the first team a, bit, a few times this season, done really well. Uh, the front three on the left hand side, I've gone for an ex hipster's choice, Seven Moreno. Uh, early 20s but uh, he's definitely moving on to bigger things now uh, right wing I've gone for Juan P at Malaga having a great season and uh, a real tricky little number uh, to watch out for in the future and up front I can't really pick anyone else but Bacambu who's been really quite incredible for Villarreal this season really picked up the mantle uh, gone for, turned from a winger into a striker playing up front with Soldado and doing magical things so uh, I'd expect him to move in the summer but uh, he's doing great th- great stuff Good stuff. And before we go to Drew, uh, breaking news, we got it wrong, just just for a change. It was actually Z-Nutter who asked us for these teams. So, um, sorry, we'll take it back. Uh, Artem Guna, Artem the Guna, Z-Nutter was the one We've who asked us. He's got to send us a, a challenge if he wants to. Oh, but... <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're open to that. We just have to give where, where credit these people that ask a question. So, do apologise, Z-Nutter, our, our bad. Uh, Drew, what have you got for us in Germany? All right. Um, some surprises, some not. Uh, goalkeeper Timo Horn. Uh, I know I've spoken about um, other young goalkeepers in the past, but I think he's more consistent for, for the age we're talking about. Uh, left back is Danny Tacosta. Uh, center backs are Jonathan Ta, which is not surprising, and uh, Nicolas Sula, which might be surprising, but he's been so improved under Nagelsmann's new system. Uh, I think he has a, quite a, a decent future ahead of him. Uh, right back is Mitchell Weiser, simply because he's been molded from uh, an attacking player to a right back. Um, a little bit later than someone like I mean, we can refer to like Hector Bell and how he started uh, as, a, as a winger in, in Barca's system and then got moved back to right back Mitchell Weiser the same thing just at a later age and, and he's done quite well for uh, Hector Bell in this season um, midfield three is uh, Pierre Mil Horberg uh, Mark Stendera and Mahmoud Daoud so that's for you John um, and, then, <laughs> and then the front three is uh, Julian Brandt uh, Timo Werner and uh, Christian Pulisic so there you go Super, super, like it. Plenty of uh, plenty of fun names there. Uh, that just leaves me then. Um, this was tough because I did it in a bit of a hurry and I'm sure I regret a few of these. I could pick others. But anyway, <laughs> let's go with it. I've gone with Benjamin Lecomte in goal, the uh, Lorient stopper. Obviously, I know him quite well. I think he's going to be uh, I think he's going to be a future French international. So he's in goal. Back four, I've gone with Sidibi of Lille, a left back. Um, he's taken his game to a new level this season. Really like him. And Benjamin Mendy at right back, the Marseille youngster um set about pairing sumaro from lille another lille player there um granted hasn't been uh, sort of ripping up any trees but he's showing signs that i think he could be a really really good defender in years to come uh, as is marquinhos at psg enough said should be in the side should have been in the side all season to be honest in my opinion uh, midfield three, two from two from Nice. Uh, Vincent Cosiello, who we've done our hipster's choice, obviously. Bags of talent, real, real future ahead of that kid. As is Nymphalus Mendy, who I think is going to be uh, arguably one of the best uh, holding midfield players in Europe in, in the next two to three years. I really think he's that good. Uh, I think Golo Kante, by the way, if you want to know what he's like. And also gone with Clare- Clare- oh, sorry, Toliso from Lyon. Can play multiple different positions. Uh, again, bags of talent, only 21. And a front three, I've gone with Nabil Fakir, standard, you've heard it all on this podcast before, absolute genius, love him to bits, Sofian Bufal on the other side probably going to move to the Premier League next year Moroccan international, bags of talent love him, and with Sam Ben Yedda I've gone with up front, could have had Michy Bashwai could have had Alexandre Lacazette, but I thought I'd go real hipster, Ben Yedda had probably had the season of his life uh, I think he's uh, 16 odd league goals I think he's got this season, and he's hardly, uh, didn't play for the first half of the season, so I think he will also get a move, probably to replace Leon's uh, Lacazette when he, when he moves on so there you go right okay that is uh, that's our teams then thank you uh, thank you ever so much for asking us for those we really appreciate uh, the questions and if you do want us to put together teams uh, give us a tweet and we will do our very best to uh, to answer those requests right that's it from us then another podcast wrapped up done and dusted episode 27 in the can uh, do tweet us your thoughts and as i say if you've got any ideas or things you want to hear from us just give us a shout um as usual we keep banging on about it but if you get a chance itunes reviews we haven't had an itunes review for a little while so if you do get five minutes and you want to give us a, a, a five-star review and a comment please do uh, youtube comments as well feel free 
and we've been getting quite a lot of um, new followers from different uh, different football clubs all around the world so if you've got a friend who likes football and isn't really familiar with podcasts just uh, just stick their ear in and see what they think of us because uh, we, we like to get new followers and new people listening in and a final plug for Danny and Ross's excellent breakfast show yesterday in my absence do give that a listen it's really really good really enjoyed it right okay so that's it from us uh, as we always say on this parish keep your beard strong and your glasses trendy thank you very much to John Drew and to Cheers, Tom boys. thank you very much and oh. what, Drew, I was going to say Drew's oh, run right away here. Yeah, good there evening. you go yeah. bye, bye Drew <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so, as always thanks very much for listening we really appreciate it keep, uh, we keep up the support we, uh, we really do appreciate everybody listening into our show we'll be back next week uh, we will hopefully be back with a satchel on Thursday keep watching your football keep enjoying your football we've been the Football Hipsters and we'll speak to you very soon Corner Oh, quel geste Quel geste L'égalisation de Zlatan Ibrahimovic Andrés Iniesta se anima, Andrés. Andrés tocó la evolución de Neymar, Messi Versucht alles aus sich rauszuholen, verfolgt von Schmelzer. Müller, vorbei an Weidenfeller. Müller, Bayern München ist Pokalsieger. Capo battere Insigne con il destro a Gero. Adelante, favoloso. Si gonfia la rete, favoloso.